Welcome to the virtual seminar Grove series with the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Uh, my name is Richard Gertain. I'm the production manager for the festival. Um, we are so thankful that you're here to join us today. We want to thank our sponsors from Cedar City Brian Head Tourism Bureau for their support of the series. And we want to let you know that today we are super excited to be talking with one of our amazing uh, artists and managers about hair and makeup, Dana Rochester. Dana, hello, welcome. Hello. I want to go ahead and share your uh, hair and makeup uh, wonderful presentation you've created for us. And maybe you can just introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself and what you've done here at the festival. All right, can you see that okay? Yep. All right. All right. Well, my name is Dana Rochester and I have been with the festival since 2008. I came in in the lowly artisan hair and makeup artist, very first position you could ever have. Uh, built up my ventilating skills, came back for several years until in 2017 when I became the director of the department. And I've been doing that job since, and it's great. I love building my career through USF and coming back every year. It's been a really wonderful journey for me. Uh, my background, my education is I went to the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, which is where I currently teach as well. I received a BFA in costume production and my focus was really in hair and makeup. So when I was a senior and did my internship, I went to the Milwaukee Rep and built mustaches and sideburn chops for a Christmas carol. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also studied abroad. I went to the University of London and then I went to Aveda, the Institute of Beauty and Wellness for my cosmetology license. So I've been continuing working in education um, throughout my career. So I currently teach costumes and makeup at UWM. And I've also taught at other universities and colleges and uh, theater companies, uh, different little workshops and classes as well. So education has always been a big part of my career. Uh, so I have past work in opera, musical theater, dance, film, fashion, commercial makeup, formal makeup. Uh, it's a little bit of everything, which is everybody's career in theater. So it's been a wild journey, like I said. Uh, mainly, I am teaching full time at UWM with doing a little bit of freelance work. And then in the summers, I'm coming out to Utah and doing full time there for uh, the festival. And so I've worked at a lot of different places, as you can see in my past company section. <laughs> All right, so we have a variety of hair and makeup jobs at the festival. Um, these are two. Uh, shots from many years ago, uh, a makeup being done for Into the Woods and maintenance being done on a wig in one of our dressing rooms. So, uh, so we have a variety of positions in our department. We are one of the smaller departments at the festival, but uh, we're pretty large for the, the tasks that we are doing. So, uh, on the top, the hair and makeup director, that's me. I oversee all the aspects of the department all year long. So I work remotely during the school year, um, but I'm still always attending meetings and taking care of the hiring and working with my staff on their schedules and things like that and always balancing the budget. So it's a whole separate job from just being a wig master as well. So the wig master is the person who really is the the designer, uh, if you want to use that term together with Wigmaster. Um, so they're in charge of building, buying, styling, altering, and taking care of the wigs. And they're the ones that take the costume designer and the director's vision of that character and make it into a reality. Um, 
and that always needs an assistant. So uh, your assistant really takes care of your Bible, all of your paperwork, making sure everything is getting documented. They're also working on builds for the show and uh, working on styling as well. And then we have hair and makeup artists or a build artisan. And sometimes this is also an internship at uh, other companies as well. And so really, they are really focusing on creating the pieces uh, like the facial hair and working on the hairlines and other various projects, but they don't have to worry about budgets and all of the other <laughs> aspects that go into working on a show. Um, our company is uh, so large and we run for so long that our team also includes a licensed cosmetologist. And so that person is taking care of all of the haircuts and colors that we would have uh, for actors that were using their own hair during the season. And then we have a run crew for the uh, actual running of the shows. And so there's always a supervisor position for each team. And we have three theaters. So we usually have about three teams of anywhere from two to four or five people, depending on the needs of the show. Um, so at, like the actors, the crew is also running shows in rep with them as well. A lot of the times our crew will follow and shadow uh, actors track as well. So uh, we have many positions at the festival here. <laughs> okay, so what we do is mainly wigs, hair pieces, and facial hair. Um, here we have a lovely, uh, oh, an old friend of mine trying on a wig at the end of a show. <laughs> we did that a lot. <laughs> okay, so um, the process, uh, it starts well before the actors even come into the picture. And that's where we start working with our costume designers. So the wig master will meet with the designers and you meet with directors and you all collaborate and formulate to uh, come up with this idea of who this character is and then actually bring it to a reality. So sometimes uh, designers, costume designers will get uh, very specific and a very uh, an image that they have in their mind and that is the image that they want reproduced exactly. And sometimes it's more of an idea of a hairstyle. And so that's where you get a little bit of creative freedom in the styling process. So there's a little design to it, but not as it's as the whole uh, job. So um, like uh, everything in our, our field here, it's all about uh, the collaborative effort in coming to that final look. Okay, so when the shows are cast, the design team meets then and then determines if the actor is going to be using their own hair or if they're gonna be in a wig or hair piece. Uh, so actors at the festival will be cast in multiple shows. So wigs are an easy option for continuity, also in keeping with the time period if it's a more intricate hairstyle. Um, but there are a lot of times where we do use the actor's own hair, especially with our male actors. And so that's why we have a cosmetologist on staff to make sure that that look is maintained throughout the whole summer, again, to follow with that continuity. Um, uh, the photo of the As You Like It image there, one woman's in a wig and one woman is just wearing a hairpiece. Can you tell which is which? <laughs> no. The redhead, that's her real okay. hair, it was glorious. <laughs> so we just yeah, added a little bit of length for her. It was great. So sometimes we do use their own hair. Most of the times it's a wig though. Okay. And why is it, why many times is it a wig, uh, Dana, versus real hair? To stay within the time period. Again, it's with that continuity real hair like hair on your head does not do the same thing every single day so with a wig you have more control over that it also saves a lot of time and not every actor is a talented stylist to do period updos so 
to put that on an actor as well. And perhaps their hair is not the correct haircut for that as well. Or a lot of factors play in and it's usually a combination, but mainly we're working with wigs at the festival. Shorter runs, smaller productions, usually you'll see more real hair, but for what we're doing in the summer, you definitely want to make it uh, smarter, not harder. <laughs> so the next thing that we do if they are in a wig is they come in for measurements and we do what is called a, a bubble or a, a head tracing. And so you wrap the actor's head in saran wrap and then you wrap it up in tape and then you can mark where the hairline is exactly and what their actual head shape is. So what we'll have is, is a copy of what their head is to work off of while the actor is off in rehearsal. So we don't take up a ton of their time. Um, so that's really important when you're customizing wigs is that you have an accurate shape of the head as well. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. Um, the differences in the wigs, there's two main differences, but the biggest distinguishing factor are what the fronts look like. So there's two different types of fronts. There is a lace front, and that is where the hair is individually tied to look like it's coming right out of the scalp. It's a very natural look. And a hard front, which is what you're finding like on Amazon, that is where you have a really blunt edge where the hair weft is just sewn right to the front of it and it creates a pretty pretty hard shadow on the stage and that's what tends to look really fake with wearing wigs and there's lots of ways to cheat that and work around it so they're not bad wigs but if you need some if you're not wearing a hat or you, your style is going away from the face a lace front is going to look the most real so and you can go to the next one. And we have an image here of a hard front, sad face and a lace front, happy face. Um, so you can see how the difference is in here. And I also think just from looking at these images that the hard front is a synthetic wig because of how shiny it is. And <clears throat> the lace front looks like a human hair wig because it's a little bit duller. Um, but both could work on stage. If the hard front is underneath a hat the whole show, no one's ever going to see that except for a little bit of hair poking out of the back. So there is a time and place for them. <laughs> okay, so materials that are used in wigs, like I was saying, it's either going to be human hair or synthetic, and they each have their pros and cons. Uh, you don't ever want to mix the two fibers, though, because how you style them is a little bit different and you can burn slash melt things if you start mixing your different fibers together. So don't do that. Um, for facial hair, we always make them in human hair because we have a teeny, teeny, tiny little curling iron called a Marcel. And that's what we use to style the facial hair so that it actually has a shape to it. And then we use a lace mesh that comes in a variety of uh, types and uh, it comes in different uh, like levels of heaviness as well. So if you use a film lace, which is much lighter, much more delicate than a theatrical lace, uh, that's practically going to disappear on a theatrical stage because it's meant for film and meant to be like filmed this close up. It is trickier to work with though. So um, most of our spaces at the theater though, we is very forgiving and we can just use regular theatrical lace. Um, but sometimes we need to use the, the finer stuff too. So just know that there's a variety of what's out there when you are working on these things. Okay. Oh, here again. So here is a uh, human hair versus a synthetic and Again, you're gonna see that the synthetic side is a little bit more shiny. The human hair side is a little bit more dull, but there's more dimension in the color. Whereas the synthetic one is one solid color. Now you can get synthetic fibers that are blended and that aren't as of a shiny product. It's really much more advanced in what those fibers are now today than what they were even 10 years ago. 
So you can get synthetic wigs that are actually looking very much like human hair and vice versa. You can get human hair and it could be very low quality and it's going to look uh, worse than a really inexpensive synthetic wig. So, I mean, you, get, you have to shop around, know where you're buying your products from um, and not, like I said, they all have their pros and cons of both products. So, but those are like the two main identifying factors. So human hair wigs will allow uh, the maximum in versatility and styling possibilities, while synthetic wigs look natural, healthy human hair, yet they're easier to maintain and they're less expensive. Uh, as an example, uh, in 2019, when we did Macbeth, we had really long, long medieval wigs. And so we ended up using synthetic wigs because the cost of the fibers to get human hair in that length, we could not afford. So we went with synthetic, which was great because it uh, it actually ended up working really well for um, our purposes. And they looked really good on stage too. So um, later in the presentation, I'll tell you a few places to check out wigs when you're shopping. So, okay. So uh, in addition to using full wigs, we can use partial wigs. We also use extensions. This is a really great way just to add length and body to someone's hair. Uh, you can get them where they just clip in. You can sew them in, get them glued in. There's a lot of different varieties. Hair pieces, a phony pony, popular throughout all fake hair history. Um, this is a great way, again, to add a little bit of hair and a little bit of um, styling your own hair around and into that piece. It actually ends up looking really real, uh, looking very realistic. When we do um, Pirates of Penzance next year, the sisters are all going to have phony pony braids coming out of their bonnets at night for their buns coming down. So instead of making those actresses wear two different wigs for the whole show, will probably end up using their own hair here because they're in hats the whole time. And then they'll have a braid that is fake that comes out that we can just pop in real quick. So again, you know, depending on what your show needs, you have all these different options available to achieve your look. So, and these are getting better and better on the market too. So how wigs are built, um, sometimes it's a combination of a lot of different patterns. Uh, some tools and materials though that you do need, no matter which option that you're choosing, is a wig block. Now these are harder than the styrofoam heads that you see in craft stores. And you want something really sturdy and stable when you're building that hairline and you'll see in the, uh, slides in the future, uh, what that work actually is. And these, again, you can find these now on Amazon very inexpensively. The quality is not the greatest from Amazon sometimes, but it, it is great if you are looking to uh, start to learn how to like do these techniques without spending a ton, a ton of money. So you'll also need a wig stand and those either clamp on right to a countertop or table, or you can get the freestanding ones. You'll need some hair. So uh, a weft is where the hairs are kind of knotted onto a string and you can either make it yourself by hand or you can buy it where it's already machine bound. You can also get hair that's raw hair where it's it hasn't been wefted, but you have to be careful that you know which end is up because cuticles kind of look like little cactuses and if they start going in both directions, that's when your hair starts knotting and things like that. So it's important that all your cuticles kind of like go in the same direction. And then yak hair is a really popular material when you're doing anything with gray hair. Um, and it's, it's really more coarsely textured like natural gray hair is. So that's a great addition to uh, anything that needs to have a little bit of age to it or if it's something that deals with animals. So usually if you see a production of like cats, usually those wigs that kind of like stand out, usually those are made out of like yak hair that's been colored and you know cut to look more like animal hair, because it is. <laughs> so uh, that's another product that's pretty popular. And then crepe hair is another uh, facial hair kind of a 
uh, uh, hair type that you can use. And there's crepe hair where you can actually ventilate and work with it. And then there's really inexpensive crepe hair that you can just kind of like glue to your face and trim it. And that's like the two penny facial hair that when you're in a pinch, you can also use that as well. Okay. So uh, there's a picture of the wig lace in the corner. It's a really fine, meshy net. That is, it's amplified. It is much, much smaller than that. Um, you can see the ventilating needles and um, it usually has a, like a spoolie to hold on to. Uh, and that's what you're gonna use to actually put the hair onto the lace. And then T-pins are another really sturdy pin, but you could use just regular quilters pins or just flathead pins as well. So um, those are some other things that you'll need if you're building wigs. Okay, so this is a photo of what our next step is. So the, you can see that the block has been padded out. You can see the hairline. And usually what we're doing is uh, for time, for budget, we're not doing a full, fully fronted or a fully hand tied wig. Usually that's done in like film when um, there's even a bald cap underneath that wig to make it look very realistic. For theater, we don't have to be quite that um, intricate. So what we usually do is, is we buy a wig, we cut half of it off. And then we redo the front half of it. So this is what looks the most natural, which is what you're mostly seeing anyway, 30 feet away. So, um, so we pat out the wig block and then we lay the lace over it. And you don't, you wanna make sure that there's no bubbles or anything. Um, and then you pin it down and then you sew the lace to the wig itself. And then once that's done, then you can just actually tie all the hairs right onto the lace. So. Um, so you can see a picture of this being set up to be ventilated. Okay, so once the lace is laid, then we move on to ventilation. And ventilation is the name of the process of tying every single hair individually into the lace that's been laid. And this, this takes a varied amount of time and this is the longest uh, part of the process you can style a wig fully top to bottom in a half hour. This takes much longer. <laughs> so here is an up close diagram of how ventilating works. So if you've ever done the latch hook rug pulling, it's like that, but microscopic. So your <laughs> ventilating needle goes in, you pull the hair through the lace and then you knot it and then you pull it back through and it's all a quick motion like this. And this is what it should look like when you're ventilating so that you don't get, you know, messed up wrists by doing this. You gotta go like this, you gotta roll it. So you're doing that at a very, 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 very small um, scale, which is why it takes a long time. <laughs> So here's an up close picture of, um, this is a wig I did uh, many, many years ago. And uh, you can see the hair kind of towards the back. There's two to three hairs in there. The knots are a little bit further apart. The closer and closer you get to that red hairline, you're doing single haired knots and you're spacing them a little bit closer together to make that density look real, very realistic. You'll also notice that this hairline, it's not a straight line across. That looks fake on stage. So you want to add that natural, interesting, unique shapes that everyone's hairline actually is. And so this is what it looked like when it was finished. Cool. And this wow. wig was uh, pretty much the same color as her natural hair. So it was very very, very natural looking on her. And it was just long, long hair. <laughs> so this was Barbara Jo in Les Mis. And this is, at, she wore a hat over it most of the time. And then the other half of the time she's in the dark shadow singing of her lament. So you didn't get to see that beautiful hairline, but it looked very great backstage. 
Are, are there special considerations when someone has a hat and then they have to take it on and off of a wig that you have to take care of? Sometimes uh, if really uh, putting hats on is more of a challenge sometimes where we have to hide magnets in there or you have to have a special rehearsal to train the actor on how that goes because usually they're not in front of a mirror, you know, standing behind someone putting it on. So it takes, you know, rehearsal just like every tech aspect of the show. Um, but again, like if I, I'm sure she took her hat off during the show and we, we did see this. Uh, but again, like I did a show Newsies a couple of years ago at Skylight and the dancers kept their hats on the whole time. So there was a few wigs that we had on there, but they were all hard fronts. You never, they never took their caps off unless if that was not part of the show. And <laughs> right. so, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you factor and you consider all that during the design process and during the build process and what is our actor doing? How do we see them in each scene? So usually we can uh, plan ahead for that, you know, during the rehearsal process. So uh, times uh, vary based on many factors, but generally you're looking at one to three hours to build a mustache. Um, a goatee, depending on how big it is, uh, four to six hours. A full beard is eight to 12 hours. Um, a front, which could be anywhere from two inches of a hairline all the way to like five or six inches, like that first image we saw. Uh, that could be 14 to 25 hours. And if you're tying the whole foundation, that's definitely going to be about 40 to 60 hours. So it takes a long time to make these pieces. And usually with our mustaches, because we run four to five shows per week for some of these shows, uh, we build multiples because a mustache can get lost on stage. Um, <laughs> during a quick change it can be ripped in half on accident someone could burn half of it off on accident so usually we have backups of the smaller pieces of facial hair and we know with the bigger ones and with the wigs we're taking very good care of those pieces because we need them to last uh, throughout the whole run uh, so some tools again just to give you some images of the well, things that we're using when we're working with hair, uh, combs, a five prong teaser is great for when you're styling and a rat tail or a tail comb, you can use that in doing wig prep and with doing styling. It's great to use those tools to kind of smooth out areas of the hair where your hands just might make a bigger mess. So it's good to have those tools handy when you're working with wigs. Um, brushes are a big thing to pay attention to also. So you'll see on this slide, uh, you have a vent brush and a paddle brush. And those are the brushes that have the little knobs, the little balls on the ends of them. You don't wanna use those in a wig because they're gonna end up catching more hair than you want it to. So go to the next slide and you will see wire brushes, like for a dog. Um, that's what you wanna use. They don't have the little the little balls on the ends that are going to catch the hair. Um, they're going to go through the hair much easier. So if you're working with a wig, make sure you get yourself an actual wig brush. And again, you can find these on Amazon. You can find these at many wig suppliers. Sometimes it's, you know, free gift with purchase. Um, and then a teasing brush is also really handy when you want to create a lot of volume in those updos. Um, so having those tools handy is uh, going to set you up for more success when you're styling. Pins are important. Um, so bobby pins are the closed ones and hair pins are the open ones. You can use both in prep and in styling. Do not ever open bobby pins when you're if, with your mouth when you are at work. It is a horrible habit for anyone who styles their own hair to use the pin in your mouth. But remember, you don't know where that pin has been. Could have been on the floor five minutes ago. So when you are backstage, I always try to catch anyone opening pins with their mouths. And especially after this year, we will never do that again. Never. Exactly. Hey. <laughs> COVID restrictions <laughs> prohibit. <laughs> You're just gonna clip them onto the sides. Um, 
Another really important pin to pay attention to is the bottom one where it says a straight hairpin. Now, those are a hairpin that's open that doesn't have the squiggles. The squiggles tend to make little holes in your lace, which you can never really fix because of the material. So using one of those straight hair pins when you're working on anything that has lace, that's going to help uh, keep your the condition of your wig in a much you know nicer state than if you were to jam those squiggly pins in there, okay? So if you're ever using a lace front, try to get yourself the straight pins and not the squiggle ones. And then there's also all the other squiggly hairpins that you can use while you're styling. Clips are important when you're doing prep and when you're styling as well. So a duckbill clip is uh, it's the one that clamps down. You can get them pretty much anywhere. Really great for holding hair out of the way. Um, so any hairdresser really should have a few of those. And then pop clips and toupee clips are really handy when you're working with really short hair. So using toupee clips on like a, a man who has a shorter haircut, instead of trying to like wrap up uh, any hair that wouldn't be long enough anyway, but uh, that way it can kind of clip into that shorter cut hair and then you can use that as a base to like secure pins under. So those are used a lot. All right. So once you have your fully ventilated piece and it's then it's time to cut and style and eventually apply the piece. For facial hair, it's glued down with spirit gum or medical adhesive. And again, those products vary. So depending on an actor's sensitivity, we'll kind of go with different products. So we have a range of those adhesives. And then for wigs, the actor's hair is put into a prep and then the wig is pinned into place. And this is a, these are just images of what a wig generally looks like after it's just been ventilated. So it'll have some real crazy long strands of the new hair that you've put in. So uh, when you are done with that, then every wig gets a haircut before it gets styled. And if this is a shorter haircut like this, this may not even have real extensive styling, but the styling is in the cut itself. So that's important as well for uh, wig, uh, designers and wig masters to take into consideration too. Uh, here is a roller set. And so when we are working with human hair wigs at the festival, heat damages hair. So the less heat curling iron type products or tools that we can use, the better. So we use these, uh, these spring rollers and then they kind of go into a giant hair dryer so that at a low heat we can uh, get these curls to set much longer and stronger than a curling iron. Um, and so this is like, this is how women used to get their hair done in the 60s and 70s and sit underneath a hair dryer and that's why their hairstyle lasted for a week is because of the process of what uh, how you style the hair this way. A curling iron doesn't really hold a style very long for most people. So uh, this is a really great method in getting that longevity out of the hairstyle. So wig prep is done a lot of different ways and it really just depends on that person's head of hair. Uh, but generally what we do is we take a couple of pin curls at the festival and then we either do a surge elast headband um, or an ace bandage headband. They're making tons of different uh, wig headbands out of different materials now. So you can get them out of silicone, you can get Velcro. Uh, there's a lot of different options out there. Wigs are gaining some popularity again. So. Um, whatever is working best for the actor, everyone has their own individual prep. Um, but that prep is a very important part because the more secure your prep is, the more comfortable that wig feels on that actor's head. If their prep isn't very strong and their wig is going around their head like it's a hat, that's gonna distract the actor on stage and we don't need that happening. So, you want to make sure it fits good, you kind of forget about it, and it looks really natural. Having a really good prep is a good step in that.
that process. So sometimes we also use to pay tape and spirit gum to secure down the lace, but it's really how that gets pinned onto the head. Maintenance. So after every single show of the run, the run crew does maintenance on every wig and facial hair piece in the show. Uh, it varies on what needs to be done. Sometimes you have to completely restyle the, the wig and sometimes you're just kind of cleaning the lace a little bit, getting all the makeup and the spirit gum off. And then you're just kind of tucking in the little flyaways. It'll, it'll go for a few more shows before you completely restyle it. Um, so it all varies. And that's where the crew head, that, that's, I feel the most important part of their job is to really watch that continuity of everyone taking care of the wigs to make sure that that wig looks as good on opening as on closing as well. Because we want to give the audience the same show no matter what. So makeup. So at the festival, uh, at most regional theaters, uh, a wig maker doesn't do the, make, uh, the makeup for the actor. Uh, here you're going to see a couple of different images of like dirt and bruises. Sometimes the actors do this type of makeup on themselves, and sometimes it needs to be a little bit more controlled. And so a crew person is assigned to specifically do all the dirty effects or bruising effects for that actor. Again, continuity. Um, and just uh, our crew really loves to be makeup, and rarely do we get a time to do it in every single show. So it's fun when we do get to do it. <laughs> So uh, what we will do though, is we'll train each actor on what the look they need to do. And if they can't do it themselves, then we figure out which crew person is going to be doing the makeup for them. So when we did Macbeth in 2019, the witch's makeup was all done by our crew. Um, this is pretty intricate. We did a few stenciling, a uh, few of these symbols were stenciled on. We were doing temporary tattoos. And there were three of them to get ready um, for pretty close to the beginning of the show. So uh, each each actor had a, a makeup artist working on them as well. And so that things like that, that's where we would come in and provide extra help. But just to do a nice stage face with some foundation, um, some definition in the eyes and some lip color, usually we're expecting our actor to be able to handle um, the basics in their stage makeup. Ooh, blood. Here's another Macbeth photo. Blood is always a very big production because you have to involve, it is the action of what the blood needs to do and what the blood is actually doing. So blood actually needs rehearsal too. So uh, there'll be blood meetings, blood rehearsals, blood trials, and then um, it is, it's about uh, making sure you have enough product when the show actually starts to run. So uh, it may seem like it's a pretty simple effect, but it, it is, uh, th there's quite a few steps and considerations that you always need to take when you decide to work with blood or dirt. <laughs> and blood has a lot of collaboration with, with others, right? With other departments? Yeah, crops, costumes, mm -hmm. lighting, scenery. You don't want your blood to drip on a chair that's gonna be sat on by an actor. Uh, some like if you choose to do an effect, some things are unavoidable. So uh, what this actor is actually doing, he he points his finger and there's blood dripping off of his finger because he's wearing a special mesh glove that has a sponge in it of really drippity drip blood. And so he squeezed it. And as he was pointing, it would drip down and you would see it. But then two seconds later, uh, later, Lady Macbeth walks across the stage and cleans it all up. So we had to make sure we were checking the bottom of her costume. We made sure that we chose a blood that could come out of costumes really easily as well, because we don't want to see it too early in that. And then sometimes blood is even just painted on a costume and it's dry and it's that's the effect. So in uh, Banquo's uh, tunic here, the stabs and the cut around 
his neck on the tunic, that's all painted on. So the stuff that was added is on top of his head, a little bit of juice right here, and the gloves that were bloody. So, and this was his second blood look. He also had a first, another entrance with blood. So that one was a, that one was a big project, but we enjoyed yeah. working on it, so. Okay, so prosthetics, again, those are totally in a field of its own when it comes to theater. We're doing multiple shows a week. We have to take into consideration how much glue the actor's face can actually handle and things like that. Um, but prosthetics can uh, be usually an extension of the nose. It could be a deep wound, uh, pointed fairy ears. Those are a couple of examples. Um, the wolf's nose, I know, because uh, I worked on this show, uh, the wolf's nose started as a very large piece that covered most of his forehead and most of his cheeks is how it started. And then as they were going through the design process, rehearsal process, it ed ended up being scaled back much further to really just be more of a T-zone and a nose application. And that made it faster for the actor to get in and out of it and for... Um, what that was doing to his skin too. So again, it kind of like evolved through the design process and the rehearsal process of to what it became for what the audiences got to see. Um, but right. that was casted, sculpted and casted by the assistant wig master that year. So they were able to modify it too. You can get those th things pre-made. So if you're doing like Shrek the musical and you're like, I don't have an ogre face, you can find those things in special effects uh, sellers as well. So here is a, a more extensive prosthetic that we did just a few uh, years ago for Big River. A character gets tarred and feathered. And so there was first a cast made of the actor's face and then the tar was sculpted by hand and then another mold was made of that. And then you could make what the piece that went onto the skin out of any material that you wanted. So um, this one was a silicone based, um, but you can also make them out of latex, foam latex, liquid latex. Again, depending on what the piece needs to do, how long it needs to last, um, what your budget is, that can all determine like how those prosthetics turn out. So I think we, that was a year we weren't doing, this was our big prosthetic piece for the last couple of years. So we haven't done one quite that big since and we hadn't a few years prior to that. So, there, you know, it's few and far between but it's great to know that you can make your own and you can purchase them if you need them. Um, theater doesn't use them as much as like film and TV does but I do sometimes. So where to shop? Okay, so I had to update my list because one of my favorite vendors closed this year, Wig America. Rest in peace. You were great. Mm -hmm. I loved your hair pieces. Um, so you might have to check back with some of these. And there are newer ones that pop up since the last time I updated my shopping vendor list. Um, but His and Hair Goods is great for buying the wefts of hair and the raw hair. Um, that I was talking about for building it because they come in a variety of colors and textures and it's pretty reasonably priced as well so that is one of my first go-to's when I'm buying mat wig building materials. Alter Bassi is another one um, they are in Europe I think they're in Germany or Switzerland um, so they take a little bit longer to be shipped and um, to receive the products but again you're going to find some really nice uh, high quality products from that website. Harris is a great just general wig su building supplies. Um, sometimes they have them in bulk uh, and things like that. And then Sally's Beauty is available to everyone and they are located everywhere. And they have a little bit of wig stuff, but uh, they can definitely like uh, give you your basic products and you can also get a discount with them too. So that's a really good just general hair and makeup resource to shop at. OK, 
Okay, and then wig and hair piece resources. Uh, if you're looking just for the actual full wig and not just all the little bits of it, uh, Wilshire Wigs is a great one. Uh, wow Wigs and Arda. Um, you can find things on Amazon, but just know if you are purchasing a $10 wig, it's probably going to look like a $10 wig. Uh, these wigs are going to be a little bit higher in cost, but they're not, they're not overpriced. So these are some nice resources that you can go to find a nice quality wig at a pretty decent price. Uh, Arda is great, but they also, because they have high volume, uh, it takes a little bit longer for them to ship that out. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're ordering online that you need to give yourself plenty of time for the shipping and then to do whatever work you need to be done. Uh, so those are some of my favorite websites. Uh, you can also, if you are in a total pinch, you can rent a lace front wig or facial hair. Uh, there's two places that are still operating. There's probably a few freelance people out there as well. So it's network with other artists first, but you can just uh, order uh, a lace front in, you know, insert time period here. Uh, they do charge per week and you do need to be careful because if you destroy the piece, they will charge you for it. So uh, just also keep that in mind if you do end up going with that option, but it is out there. So there's two places that you can check out as well. Makeup. So makeup, uh, everything that I've listed here is for very more specific theatrical makeup. Uh, many actors will use MAC, Bare Minerals, Aveda, um, Smashbox, Bobby Brown, the list goes on and on and on. You can even use CoverGirl and Maybelline from Walgreens. Um, the ingredients pretty much all come from the same sources. And so really you are just paying for whatever that label and packaging is. So makeup you need to try and because it, it because it is like a, it's an it's it's consumable it can expire it reacts different differently on everyone's skin so what may work for actor a may not work for actor b so you really just, it's it's all about trial and error but if you are looking for like specific hd makeup or stage blood or charcoal powder or clown white or things like that these are the list of vendors that you want to check out. And this is specifically for theatrical makeup. Um, Alcone is really great. I order from them all the time because they just have everything. Um, Friends is another great one. It's a West, Clo uh, West Coast location. So if I'm in Wisconsin, I might order from a New York company than a California one. But when I'm in Utah, I tend to use the California vendors because I know they're going to be shipped and come to me much faster. So that's why I just, you know, have a couple of stores on every coast. Right. Uh, Krylon, again, that's a German based one. So that one's coming from overseas. If you are looking for uh, water-based makeups, their aqua color is my favorite in the water-based makeups. Um, Skin Illustrator is an alcohol-based makeup, and this is used primarily in television and film. It's pretty harsh on the actor's skin, so we don't tend to use it often in, in theater, but again, that's a great product to try out. And Gravity and Momentum was that uh, blood I was mentioning where it comes out of all the clothing. So we've used that blood more than once. You can get a sample pack, you can kind of play with the viscosity of it, and it is a consumable, it does expire, so don't buy more than what you need. Um, some other useful supply resources, uh, Surge Elast, like I said, that you do get from Amazon, and it is medical bandage, so you want to order the size 5, which is for the head, shoulder, or thigh, and then you're going to cut it down because it comes in one long tube and you're gonna cut it down to just a few inches and that's what creates like the wig headband cap, okay? Um, and then you can just dye it to match your actor's hair color or wig. Uh, skin Prep Wipes is another really great product that you should try to have on hand. 
And what that does is that creates a protective layer um, in between the skin and whatever the adhesive product is. So it's used a lot in microphone, like when you're using a microphone and, and you tape it. So because the tape is always irritating the skin by putting that little barrier there, that really helps with the sensitivity of uh, those the effects of those products. And so we can use that too when we're doing like on top of the lip every single night, put a little barrier there and then it, they're not completely red for when they're in the show that they don't have any facial hair. So again, we wanna be nice to our actors. We need them to do all these things all summer long. And then Manhattan Wardrobe Supply, that's just a great store for any wardrobe or hair and makeup needs. So definitely check them out if you're looking to stock up your backstage supplies. Oh, and these, <laughs> Wonder Flex World and I Kick Shins. If you're looking for non-traditional wig building materials, these are some good uh, locations to check out. Uh, they're gonna have a variety of items. And then books, if anyone still reads books, I have some good ones here to check out. Uh, anything by Allison Laurie and Martha Ruski, that is gonna be your go-to textbook on how to learn how to do these different period hairstyles. So that roller set that I showed you, that's a pattern. Anyone can reproduce that to get that hair style looking like that. So in these books, they really break it down step by step on how to achieve those different time period looks specifically for wigs. So they're all great, anything by them. And then Fashions and Hair, The First 5,000 Years by Richard Corson. Anything by Richard Corson is like the grandfathered in education source of every hairdresser knows what uh, these books are. So um, if you do want an investment, definitely get the fashions in hair. It is a book that is like literally this thick and it's all line drawings taken from uh, paintings in various sources. So you can really see like what the silhouette looks like. And it's just a wonderful resource that you can't always find things like that real quick, uh, historical wise when you're doing online research. So these are just some really great how-to books, some reference books that you should check out. And that was pretty much the end. I just threw one more photo in there. So thanks for watching. Amazing, okay. thank you so much. Um, I'm having a little bit of audio feedback, so I apologize for that. Um, but Dana, I wanted to thank you for that amazing presentation. Um, I learned a lot stuff I didn't know. I feel like I'm going to be a better production manager for you, hopefully now after I learn all that stuff. Um, I just had a couple questions. Uh, I want to apologize to our, our audience that wasn't able to maybe watch us all the way through, but this, this is going to be posted. Everybody's going to get to see this on our YouTube channel as well, so please check that out. Um, but a few things just about you that I wanted to check in with. You know, we got a nice background about you, but I, I always like to ask our guests how they got into theater. Like what brought you to this, this wonderful world of, uh, of live performance and how you got, like, how did it bring you to hair and makeup and wigs? Well, I, I was like a total child performer. I did dance. I was in a choir. I did all that in my youthful years when I Went to college though, um, I developed a really bad case of stage fright. And even as a teacher, like I still feel it, like even before I'm comfortable now, but when we first started, I definitely had a lot of butterflies. So I couldn't get over that. And I was like, I'm not gonna build a career over that. So, um, but still wanting to stay in theater, I really love doing costumes. And so that's where I kind of concentrated in. And then just my own performance background, knowing kind of how to do my own hair already, having done it in high school productions, it was just kind of like a natural next step for me. And so, you know, I just kind of followed along with that. And uh, really in like the last five or six years, I've actually been doing more costume work than hair work. Whereas the beginning of my career was mostly all hair and makeup. And, um, 
when uh, Jeffrey Leader, our costume director, who used to work at the university with me, um, when he retired, I took over some of his costuming classes. And so now I'm actually getting more and more into doing costuming now. So it's kind of like it shifts and moves, but I've always done theater for as long as I could remember. <laughs> Um, what would you say to a, a young person or someone new coming to this kind of work? Um, you know, like any advice about like just getting into it? You gave so many resources, so much information there, but just like, how do you get started? Like, where do you, is it just, is, uh, you know, what, what, what would you suggest somebody who wants to just explore it more? Well, first I would, networking is really important in theater because we are, we are a small family, but we're a really big family. So um, getting into, first, first you have to kind of build your portfolio if you aren't already introduced to that world. Um, so get a mannequin head, just practice doing, if you're into hair, then just keep practice doing different hairstyles and documenting it, uh, research, or, you know, all those portfolio pictures. Yep. Um, you know, and then, What's great about like YouTube today is like it teaches you how to do those things and you can practice them. So once you have, once you have like a look or something that you've created that you are very happy with, you should take photos of that and then start building that portfolio. Then finding jobs, um, you can look online, you can see uh, what companies are like around you uh, that could be hiring. A lot of times just to get your foot in the door, an internship is um, a pretty nice option or just kind of like volunteering your time, just again, just to introduce yourself to, to what that company is doing. Um, so those are some ways to like kind of get into it. Um, again, if you take classes, like when we're able to have like face-to-face -face workshops again, you go to a hairstyling workshop and you get to meet other people that are working in different areas and network with them. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's a lot how hairdressers work too. And like makeup artists work is again, those referrals and that networking. So it's just about practicing and then getting yourself out there, you know, meeting, like doing Zoom, Zoom meetings with uh, masterclass artists that are offering that right now is a great time just to kind of like, like sit at home and start, you know, practicing and building those skills again. So, you do have to be kind of self-motivated when it comes to being an artist of any kind. Um, continuing your education whenever you can is also a really great option, so. Very cool. And so what would you say, we touched on it a little bit um, about sort of how, how the world is, uh, is affecting how we do our work. What do you think will change or be different about the work that you have, that you're doing in the coming season in the future as sort of a reaction to the world and how it is now and how we think it'll be when we, we can come back together? Well, for hair and makeup, uh, it, it already was a very, like, I already had a huge stock of Lysol before this happened because when you're working with hair and makeup, that relationship and that closeness, because it has to do with a lot of like sweat and, you know, you're gluing things to someone's face. We're already very big on hygiene, good hygiene practices. And I think we're just gonna really amplify that in the next coming years, which is great. We should do that anyway. I, for one, never think we are cleaning enough. So, <laughs> Very cool. so I think it's just being more aware of, you know, of, of being clean and, you know, cleaning off of our surfaces and the tools that we use every day and things like that. So just be more aware of it. Well, I want to thank you again for this tremendous, uh, so informative uh, masterclass in its own right. I mean, we could, I know you like took, I don't know, however many decades of experience you have and compressed it into this very short, amazing, <laughs> succinct um, pre uh, presentation. But um, I just wanted to thank you for your time and your expertise and your years with the festival uh, and all your service with us. Did you have any other last thoughts or last comments you wanted to leave us with? Um. No, not really. I don't know. No, are you... <laughs> uh, apply. We take new people every single year. Uh, a little bit of experience is great. A lot 
of an experience is even better. No experience, you know, you have to start somewhere. So apply here, apply anywhere, just whoever you can get a show with, make your own show at home. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And if you go uh, to our webpage to uh, bard.org, um, here in the next couple of weeks, uh, positions in hair and makeup, as well as all the other different production departments will be listed um, in, in the next few weeks. So you go to bard.org and go to employment and you'll see all our open positions. So please, yes, take a look at that, get experience, come, come work with us, come talk uh, and learn from Dana. Um, I also want to say that all of our other presentations, all our other seminars are on our webpage as well. Uh, again, look for uh, bard.org and virtual um, uh, virtual offerings on our webpage. You should be able to find that and all of these other conversations we've had uh, here on um, here about virtual seminar Grove. Uh, thank you again to Cedar City Brian Head Tourism for your support of us. These, this conversation and others will continue next year. We're going to have more seminars. Um, this is our last for this year. Uh, love to end it with Dana and this great conversation, but we will return January 7th uh, for more conversations. We're going to talk about wardrobe next. So the people backstage that uh, help care for our uh, our costumes and our actors and how we get them, uh, how we take care of them in their productions. Uh, lots of really interesting conversations and information to get from there. Uh, and then we'll continue. And also there'll be some conversations to give you teasers about our 2021 season and talk to you more uh, with the directors and design teams there and give you more information about the upcoming season when we can't wait to get all of you with us again here in Cedar City. Uh, Dana, thank you again so much. Uh, thank you to everyone who has uh, been watching these and continue to watch and can't wait to uh, see you all in person and see you at our next uh, seminar. Goodbye and thank you.